Good evening, and uh, this is Project Healing Waters Omaha program. And uh, tonight we have a special guest uh, tie-in for us tonight, Paul Fidelis from uh, Australia. He's going to tie a couple of his favorite um, flies. So take it away, pa Paul. I guess I, I get to go do the big speech, and my wife always tells me, I was born in Pennsylvania. I grew up in California and went to school in Colorado. Thing is, I've never, ever fly fished in the U.S., and I didn't uh, pick up fly fishing or fly tying until I retired in 2007. So what I'm going to do is I'm my nearest fly fishing shop that has only minimal fly tying supplies is 100 miles away. So, And the postage, as Al knows, is really high. And the time between ordering and delivering is is weeks. Uh, one thing, one of the good things about tying on flies is it's probably less expensive, and you're not invested mentally in the fly. So if you put one in the trees, you're not going to climb up and save it because it costs five bucks. You just break it off and spend your time fly fishing. Um, my philosophy of fly tying is a bit weird. In nature, the weakest or injured animal usually gets eaten by the wolves and the lions. The misshapen, the poorly developed, or slow hatching insect usually gets eaten. So there is hope if your flies look crappy. I think smaller seems better than big. Less is better than more. Profile is better in color, and the bottom of the fly is more important than the top. I'm a basketball coach. As you know from training, and you you can't play basketball without learning the bait, mastering the fundamentals. So the same goes with fly tying and fly fishing. Dave Wilson, who taught me the fundamentals of, of fly tying, has a fly tying course which covers the core skills, which is you guys have talked to Dave, right? He's going to tie later on. And once you master the core skills, you really can tie any fly that you want. Now, I got a few learning tips. Tying a new fly. Everybody in the military remembers the seven Ps. Do you guys remember that? I got to admit, Paul, proper no, you got to stump preparation me. Preparation prevents piss poor performance. Okay, all right. Now okay, I remember. So, <laughs> so uh, in tying a new fly, I think uh, you know what you see. You get all your materials ready. I use magnets to. Ed, Al uses a little clips. I use magnets to put all the the hooks on. You crush the barbs and add the beads and any lead free wire. I don't use lead-free wire. I don't think you should use it. The other thing is that my philosophy is you crush all the barbs unless you're hunting for meat and you're fishing for meat. And if, you, if you're not fishing meat and you're letting them go, then if you don't crush the barbs, you're a barbarian. Don't lick your fingers. Use a, a sponge cup. We discussed this before. Remember, you're dealing with dead animal parts, so you don't want to go licking your fingers. And when you finish tying, you should always wash your hands. And my theory on learning how to tie flies, you want to tie at least four flies. And what you do is your production tie. So you do step one, like put the tails in, and then do step one and another, you know, two, three, and four flies, so that you end up by the fourth one, they might be good. You know? And you keep a record of which fly is in order. And so at the end, you can, you can use to use the fly that, that's better. And then um, Sally Han I use Sally Hansen's Heart as Nails is nail polish, which is a poor man's Zappa Gap. And you keep your Sally Hansen's in a small cup. Now I've made a I got a gonna switch cameras now. If it works. No. Nah. It worked fine it earlier. I'll get there. There. How's that? These are all the materials that I use to um, for fly tying. The makeup brushes I use for tails. This little stuff over here on the right are the. It's a, actually a dog ball that I cut up, and you can use those tendrils for your woolly worm. These, um, the little things in the middle are eyes. 
and instead of paying eight dollars for the plastic eyes and you get six or ten or whatever it is you get that for a buck and then i use wire you know ex wire for for all my when you need wire i just strip the the bits of um Blake cable. And the other thing too is I, I use woolly nylon. If you notice how it stretches, can you see that? And there's 13 colors. I put three up there. Those are the three main ones. I'm on my second ball or think of, of black. And the um, thread is 1,600 meters for $6. So I'm going to screen share now. I need to screen share. Can you do something for me? Okay, now you should be able to share. There you okay. go. We up? Yes, sir. Okay. Looks now, good. the one I'm the fly I'm tying is an orange bead headed red tag. The first tie they first fly they teach you to tie here is a red tag. And the, for some reason, I think I worked it out. Every fly you put an orange bead on, the fish really like it. And I think it's mainly because the orange bead head is similar to the eggs. You know, when the because the trout when when there's a like when they're the um, spawn run or the brown trout, well the rainbow trout follow the brown trout up, and as the brown trout lay their eggs, the rainbow trout are right behind them. And they're eating their eggs, you know. And so the orange egg, the orange um, bead, and then the red tag. So I figured I'd combine the two together. I'm just putting these in so that the people that look at the video can see it. This this is some of the wire. That wire there, that's enough wire for your lifetime. And I you pay a meter, you pay two dollars for a meter of the stuff. Let's put the tying instructions up. I'm not going to read them. I'll just leave them there for a while. And this is some of the materials. This is that's Norman Island. The other, I, this was in my last talk. This sparkle stuff you use, you know, flashing stuff. And that's curtain fringe. And that costs $6.95 for all that curtain fringe. The other fly I'm going to use is the pogo nymph, which you did you you said you're look it might be a good crappy fly. Yeah, I bet that'd be what, good for bluegill and trout. Yeah, what anything? What I use is I use the orange bead headed fly as a point fly, and the pogo behind it. And what happens is as you're pulling the bead head through, the pogo is going up and down. That's you know, that's why I call it the pogo. These are the materials. Going my through through the brush. Tying instructions. I'll leave them for a while. My problem is I go too fast in these things. Now this is a wiggly worm, which is a San Juan worm. I've tried all sorts, you know, that material you get. And you just can't tie it and it goes all over the place. And I found out if you get the these are dog ball that you cut up and you cut the pieces off. And I use three three pieces to do the mug well, my throat I call it three piece wiggly worm. The big thing about it is when you finish it, you don't put any um Sally Hansons or anything else because it melts, melts the plastic. The last fly is a carp fly. And all it is is those tendrils, and I tie it on using the Sally Hansen. So, Paul, the orange and yellow stuff is from a dog ball, correct? Sorry? The uh, the, the uh, San Juan worm, you know, the tendrils? You know, yeah, the, the last orange. one. Yeah, those, those are actually from a dog ball? Yeah, it's you know a little round ball with a little tenders, you know where you throw okay. it and it's real soft and spongy. Okay. Dollar store then, bill. Okay. And then where do you get those eyes, Paul? 
the eyes I get from the, I call it the Chinese junk shop. I have a bad name for it, but I call it the Chinese junk shop. And they have all sorts of stuff like that. You know, and you, I usually go in and ask the ladies, I need this, and they take me. I walk in the door now, they know me. You're back, you know. But uh, I used to, and I got all my plastic beads. There used to be a bead shop, and these Chinese ladies ran the bead shop, and I used to go in with a hook with the barb crush, and I said, I need red red beads to match the the hook. And so they'd go into the shop and come back and hand in, you'd buy 100, you know, 100 or 200 beads for a dollar, you know? Wow. And then, and then the thing is, if you don't have lead, I, you know, I don't use any lead. I got lead-free wire because I get it from the U.S., but you can always use wire, you know, to, to for, for weights. The good thing about that carp fly is that it's real easy to tie and it sinks because the material just grabs water and sinks. Now, what I'm going to try and do now is change over to my fly and see what happens. We see that all right? Yeah, that looks good. Very sharp okay. camera. That's Al's fault. My wife hates you, Al. <laughs> I'll be careful not to come to Australia to get shot I at. I would, yeah. You, know, you and Dave Wilson are not on our good, good person's list. Now... I'm going to go slow because I usually go fast when I do this. If I could cut it. Now the red tag has um I just use straight wool. Hey, Paul, I have acrylic and cotton. Those would probably work, wouldn't they? All right. I have acrylic or cotton here that my wife picked up at Joanne Fabrics. Anything. That would probably work. Okay. Cool. Yeah, Thank that'll you. work. You can use any yarn, pretty much. Uh, most of the stuff I think I have is Antron or acrylic or something. Or you, you, okay. can, use, you can use craft foam. Or you know, what's it, you know, the, the craft wool. All right, now this is one of the the wire I use. I cut them longer so that my big fat hands can um, do it. And I, I thank Al for teaching me this trick. And this one I keep, instead of putting it on the other side, I tie it on the near side. Hands aren't working. Now I have a big box of hackle pieces. Anytime I don't use a bit, I throw it in the box and that's, that's what I use for flies like this. And it doesn't matter what size, um, Hackle you put on it, and it doesn't matter which way you put it, just tie it in so it stays. Got a big now I always tie in my peacock curl from the from the front. I hate it when people reach and it understood. And I'll use two pieces. 
I'll do it two ways. The normal way is where you wrap and the show off way. Get it. And I always wrap from the front to the back and then back to the front. That way, if I miss any places, I always get them. That's pretty slick. I like how you did that peacock curl. And I learned this on one of the trips. I don't know who gave it. I saw this on one of the, um, I don't know whether it's Al or whether it was Healing Waters. Was this, did, did the guy showed this on, for you, Al, or was this? Uh, I hold both the wire and the hackle together. I'm not sure, Paul, probably, uh, probably all of the above. Yeah, I think we've all seen it. I, I've oh, seen kind of uh, a... I've seen that technique for putting on dubbing. Uh, yeah, the guy who who does the Norvice, I forget his name. Uh, he's got some YouTube videos that are older, um, where he shows how to apply the dubbing using the his the motorized uh, Norvice. I think it's the Norvice. Yeah, is that Norm a Norvice Norlander? You've got, Paul? Yes, yes, Norm Norlander. Yeah, Paul, is that a Norvice you've got? Yeah, they're pretty good too because I busted the the eyes on it or the uh, stem here. I don't know how it happened. It just cracked, and they sent me a new one. Now that looks pretty cruddy until you trim all the crud off of it. And that is what I use. Bead headed red tag. Oops. That is a cool Any fly. Any questions on that? Pretty easy. Yeah, that's a cool fly. You know, when I first learned how to tie, my instructor would have been slapping my hands with a ruler if I'd been cutting hackle like that. I know. What's well, so I said? I'm 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 pretty um not Traditional, best way to describe it. <laughs> I think mock flies are pretty messy, but they catch fish. So I, yeah. You, know. you don't you don't tie flies for people. You tie them for fish. Yeah. Now the next one is a pogo nymph. Waste a lot of thread. That rotary vice makes I certain use... operations really nice. <laughs> Sorry? I said the rotary vice sure makes certain operations nice. Yeah. It's it's good too because it's got that straight angle. There's there's a um smaller um whole set of smaller teeth that used for smaller flies. Yeah, I've liked that Norvice for a long time. It's just a little more money than I than I can justify spending. Well, I I get US Social Security with a massive $220 or or so a month. And it's sort of like monopoly money. It doesn't count. Yeah, so that's how I get all the stuff. Now I use the brush, makeup brush for a lot of tails. My tails used to be always really too big; they'd always be too long, 
And so I've got the system now where I measure the distance of the hook shank and tie it in the middle using a pinch wrap. And you get what looks like, I think, the right dimensions. At least it looks good to me. Thanks again, Al. <laughs> Now this one I wind up on the other side of the hook. This is really a pheasant tail nymph. And I just don't like making the tails with the pheasant tail. Now this will make you happy. You take nine or five pieces of pheasant tail. This is just great. the right amount. And what I do, I used to, when I tie tails, you know, I tie it and then I tail it back so that you can't pull it, you know, so your tail wouldn't twist. Now I cut tips off and I tie it forward a bit and then take it back. And because I have nine or five, it doesn't really matter when some break or whatever. And then all I do is wrap it forward. I know Al must be cringing. Oh, I was just thinking what a great job you're doing. And then I reverse rivet. Use my wire plier or my wire scissors. Now this here is talking to beginners now. That's a pheasant tail nymph. You can do flashbacks. You can do, um, you know, different colors, whatever it is on the top. What I'm doing is I'm making it, I'm putting a foam body on it. Looks a bit thick. Tie that in and take it back almost to halfway. Then get my peacock curl, three pieces. Two will be enough. That pheasant tail, was that dyed? Sorry? That pheasant tail, was that dyed? It looks kind of like a green yeah, color. Yeah, that's green. Yeah. Dyed green. Drop my pheasant tail. I hate that when that happens. I got from a friend of mine has a friend who has peacocks. And so he gives me big bags of peacock curl, which you immediately got to put in a freezer and kill all the animals that are growing. All right, now tie that in. I'm 
the crowd the eye. Now I get my rubber leg, cut it in half. Cut it in half again. Move my thread so it's in the middle of the thorax. That's looking pretty crappy. Hands don't work these well these days. Work slower. I usually do one, two, and a one or a two -er and, and a one -er to finish, like one half hitch. Pull that fairly tight. Cut it fairly close. Get the sides of that off. And I generally measure the front of flies with my hand, cut them off. And the rear flies are just a little bit past the body. That's a good thing I don't need to use that again. And the last thing I do is I take a um, pan. This is bronze green. Oh, look at that. Now that sits on the back. So I run the, this, I guess, this is the point fly and this one's behind. I use a um, floating line, a braided leader, tie that on, you know, with a fluoro tippet, tie that on. It sinks just enough to where it's not on the bottom. And this is in the back. And as you go, it, it comes up and down. Or I guess if you 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 could make a bigger bigger foam and um, use it on a, as a surface fly too. Any questions yeah, on thinking, that one? I really like that. I I think for bluegill you could uh, try to float it for as long as it'd float, but if it did sink, I think it'd sink really slowly. Um, I think that'd be dynamite. Now, do you do you tie to the um, you tie to the bend of your uh, bead head red tag, or how Sorry? do you do? Your, how do you do uh, your? Well, I usually fly? I'm I'm turning around to so I usually use a long tippet. You know how you when you do a surgeon's knot, right? And then you have the instead of cutting that tag end or whatever it is, I just hang it off the back instead okay. of tying it to the the um. Because I crush the barbs, and right? So I'd, that you know, like, did I describe that right? You know, where you tie yeah. a surgeon's knot, where you tie tippet on, and you tie the fly to the the tippet, but then the tag end you make longer, and it hangs down below the below right. The you fly. Tie, tie a surgeon's knot, and then the the and uh, instead of cutting the, the tippet, the tag of it, the tag of it that's away hangs from long, yeah, yeah. You make a longer tag, tag. It's away from your knot is what you uh, use yeah. to tie your other fly on with. What do you use those for in Australia? 
Sorry. What do you What do you fish? What do you fish well, for? When when, those flies? when I go to a lake and fish, which is a four hour drive away from here, and we fish a lake, and it's like it's like a stock lake, but it's not. You know, the fish aren't starving. You know, so you actually have to catch fish. But um, I fish that, and I fish those. But what it usually when, because I tie lots of flies and fish very little, when I have a lot of flies, I take all my flies, and I have a sort of deal that if I catch two or three fish on one fly, well then I change flies. You know, I you know just it's not so much the quantity; it's just I like to see which flies of mine that work. I like the streamers. We um we have a a pest fish here called red spin, and they. They get about that size because they they breed prolifically and they get so many fish in the pond that they can't grow any any bigger and they're a little bit too big for the trout to eat. If the redfin have a bigger area, some of them get to be that big, and they're supposedly good eating. But the last time I I went fishing, I caught um, thirteen trout, all pretty good size, and about fifty five redfin, and. Uh, and all you do is with the red fin, you just bat them on the head and throw them in the weeds. And usually the the there's some eagles and the birds and whatever would come, foxes and that when they would they'd eat them. But we left a trail of red fin all over the place. Sounds like a great time. Now the next now that I use these, I don't know if you can see it or not, as a threader for my hook. So if I wanted to thread which I, when I cut this, I didn't hold on to it. And it, you know, the, because the <clears throat> sponge, when you first get your Norvash, you spend your whole life threading it because you forget that when you cut the thread, you got to hang on to the Norvice or the. Is that because it stretches, it snaps back through there? Yeah. But it's, you're, you're, I think it's also it's a, re it's a retractable around. bobbin there, Mike. Yeah, it's a retractable bottom. And once you use one of these, I'll talk now without thing in my mouth, you can't use one of the regular bobbins. You just, I just can't anymore. When I demonstrate or when I, you know, go, used to go with the club, and um, I just couldn't do the user bobbins. I tangled it up everything. Huh. And that pushed that through someday. And you just I've never used the, one of those. Your thread through. And these are these are the things that the kids use for their teeth for, to put them um, to clean the you know when they got the. Uh, um braces right and we i bought some when i was in the u.s and they're like two dollars for 30 or something like that not and and they came here and they're really were really expensive and my local pharmacist only had um he had three of them and one other guy that lived in the area we went and bought one and we ended up buying the other one they were like 15 dollars each and she thought she had a run on the thing. So the next time we went in the pharmacy, there was what half a dozen of them there. And I don't think there are probably still a half a dozen of them there. But that's a that's a really good thread. Now what I'm going to use that for is for the next fly, which is a gonna be this wiggly worm. And you get the tendril. And you got, there's a cut end and a round end. And what you want to do is you get a 45 degree cut on the cut end. All right. And what I'm doing is I'm going to put my threader through the bead, maybe. Put the tendril in the little you 
and pull it through the bead, maybe. It worked in practice. I'm not cooperating here. Yeah, stretch it maybe. Yeah. Holding a big steady is a problem. I apologize for this. No problem. We're not going anywhere. That's it. So that's just like the dental floss they use for braces. Sorry, I cut that's it. Like the dental, oh, the, that's like the this dental stuff here floss. is. Yeah, I busted that one. It's like mono, kind of. Uh, okay. And it's fused together at the end, and they're just little loops that uh, they sell for dental appliances. And they're they come in a pack. Come in a pack like that. Okay. This is gone. Having fun with this bead. Using a smaller bead, maybe, than the practice one? Yeah, I got the beads too small. Maybe just grab the very tip of that uh, tendril. Okay, what we're going to do, well, it's not going to go through. And that get another bead. I'll go with a bigger bead and a different color. You just pick up the beads anywhere, or how do we do it here in the U.S.? Sorry, uh, in the U.S. I mean, do we just Go down to like a craft store or something and buy beads, or yeah, there's all different sizes and colors and materials that they make them out of. And yeah, um, you can also buy colored beads from the fly shops. Uh, yeah. You're going to pay a little bit more. Yeah, if you go to a craft shop, they usually have beads. And yeah, the problem with that is the, the the craft shop beads don't have the hollow in the back end of it like uh, the fly beads. No, but uh, you have to make sure that. You have to make sure that it'll go over the hook. That was what was yeah. nice about the Chinese ladies is that I would um, crush the barbs on the hooks and then um, they would bring the fly over or the feet over and I would, you know, I did this twice. All right, make believe. It does work. We'll wing it. The bee was there for a bit of weight. See, I can do it. It did work before. Mm -hmm. Right. There we go. I cheat. Take your time. Okay, so now got it through. You want to pull it tight. Make sure. Paul, I just thought through. of an idea. What if you That's what it. if you pull the tendril through the bead, and then stick the bead over the over the hook yeah well see it worked before it just didn't work on those that bead right okay now i want to make it so it's just about Hands aren't working today. Mm. 
That stuff is squishy, isn't it? Hmm. Yeah. And if you push it too hard, you cut it. Cut it. I wanted to make it. Okay, so I get that bit. I get another one. And I cut the 45. Stretch it. So it comes back. And it winds up on top. It's a terrible job of time flies. And I get my third one. And tie that in. The last time I did that, I swore. Remember that, Al? <laughs> I do. I do. Big ugly bulb there. Okay, and I get the third one. And tie it in. And I wrap that. I think this one has leprosy and it's got all that growth on it. <laughs> and lost it. Now, if I wouldn't tie on TV... I'd have taken this out of the hook and thrown it in a bin. Which I'm going to do as soon as I finish the fly. That looks like an injured and vulnerable worm. Yeah, it's crap is what it is. <laughs> Where's the one I showed you? Was it a good one? Oh, I used that one. I had one. Did I actually look good? Well, anyway, I think we'd say that that was a complete failure. But we get the point, and I really like how that front one goes through the bead. I think that's a yep. really sharp, sharp look like that. And then if you can stretch it, what I think I used the wrong thread. I should have used the um, a woolly nylon which gives you a better, um, that you can flatten it out. I'm trying to look where I put the good fly. Okay. Well, there's one there. See, that's the practice fly that I did. Yeah, that looks nice. That was better than this one. That can go in the bin. Mm -hmm. 
Now the next well, one, go on, sorry. No, would, I was just curious, would uh, the dubbing wax and anything like that ever help hold anything like this in place? No, no, uh, you, anything you put on it, they melt. I mean, it, this is a cheap Chinese stuff. You know, the, the woolly stuff is a cheap Chinese crap. I wonder what they do with that. It's, there it is. That's the bad one. But see that, that'll catch a fish. Yeah, it will. Yeah, the fish are dumb. I'm sorry. It's got a little bit of wiggle to it, whatever. And the last one is the carp fly. And I'm using woolly nylon for that. We used where to have... Do that, where do you get that woolly nylon? From the... Um, it's a fabric store. It's... It's, it's nylon stretch overlocking thread. There's overlocking thread and there's the nylon stretch stuff. The overlocking, and it's, it's you know, like I said, it's really cheap. It's great. It's harder to break. And you can pull it tight or not. And there's like 13 different colors. And if you ever find chartreuse, buy them all. I used to have a, one of them in, in chartreuse. But uh, we get all different colors. This is a, a yellow. And all I do is put the... Put the thread on top. A lot of people put, you know, you put a bead on the hook. And, and it usually fills up the, you know, the hook gap. If you... If you, um, you know, like when you want to use beads on a hook or whatever, I run it through the, like this one, I'll run that bead through the, with monofilament and you hold the monofilament together and tie it on and then it sits on top. Like when we, we have um, the spawn run, you know, where they're, and everybody's using um, glow bugs, which I, I refuse to use. I don't use any, um, Woolly, woolly worms anymore because the fish swallow it and they're hard to kill. Now we have a, we had this thing we used to have was a carp bash. Now carp is a noxious species, species here and it's just ridiculous. And so in New South Wales, if you catch one, you can't put it back in the water. You're supposed to kill it. And, uh, And so we go to the carp bash, and it was at the power station, which they just closed down. You know, the greenies had them close the power station. Now it was a big lake, and there were almost millions of carp in the lake. And the, the, the local club in the Hunter would would um, have what they call a carp bash, and you go down there and you'd sleep in the on the floor in the at the power station. And they bring a trailer load of bread, and you would, it wasn't fishing, it was catching. And if you didn't catch 100 carp on the weekend, there was something wrong with you. And they're all about five pounds. So it was quite fun. And I came up with this one. What, what is the, the fuzzy material? Um, Sorry? Paul? What is the fuzzy material again, please? That's it. It's stuff from the, you know, when you, um, one of those cleaning brushes, you know, the, the cleaning things. You know, where you put a glove on. Uh -huh. Yeah, we call, we call them mop flies. Like a du yeah, dust a mop, mop kind of thing. Yeah. Oh, dust mop. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. And I spent more time on this when I would usually do it. A lot of times, and what I would do, is I throw a bit of Sally Hansen's on it. And so at the carp bash, they would give you bread. And once you got the carp coming, you can't believe how many there were. They're all about five pounds, so they're really good. And you'd throw the bread out, and people were throwing a fly out, and I'm going, if it looks like a piece of corn, 
and it sinks. And so I would throw out a scoop of, of burley and all the carp would come running to it and you'd cast your fly into the middle of the burley and when the fly disappeared, you'd have a fish. I mean, that's what it was like. It was just catching. And the whole thing was, is it we we're throwing them out on the bank and there was um, some greenies with the leather hats and all that. And they'd come by and pick them up and take them away and, and turn it into fertilizer. And we had when you went, you had to sign a, a uh, written statement that you wouldn't leave a hook in the in the carp. You know, and so it and the big thing was they smelled so bad that if you, you take your net along and you'd have to take a plastic bag with you to cover the net so you wouldn't stink out your car on the way home. And the uh, I used to take my net and throw it out in the backyard and hose it down and leave it outside for three days before I could use it again. I'll, if I screen share, I can show you that tendril. There Roll it is. The camera. My bad. We got it now. Get me right. We can see your PowerPoint. You're sharing your screen. Yeah, am I getting it? Um, for some reason I got all small. There you go. All right. Did you see that? Yeah. Did everybody see it? Yeah, we sure did. Yep. 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 Okay. Stop share. Well, except for the willy worm, that was a all right, a bit of a disaster. But I have had I've had good results with the bead head. Everything in it, it seems like all our fish, all our trout, like an orange bead head. I think the go-to fly when you go to Tasmania, the guy, the guy, guy came and gave us a demonstration on all the flies, and he didn't want us to take a picture of his go-to fly, which was a a seals. Seal spur um, nymph with an orange bead head. So, do you just have uh, rainbow and browns mostly yeah. in Australia, or do well, you have actually, any like? Actually, the the first fish I ever caught on a fly that I tied myself were two brook trout. One was six pounds, and one was four pounds. Right? Oh my goodness! And what it was is that the hatchery they were breeders. And they hatchery released them into the lake, and uh, and they had swam to the other side of the lake where I was, and it was you know it was strange because I caught I hooked a dozen fish without moving in the lake, and uh, seven I, I landed nine, seven of them were rainbows, and two were the brook trout, and my wife was always bagging me about bring a fish home, bring a fish home, uh -huh. and so I. I I kept the two brook trout, and those are the last two fish that I ever kept um, on purpose. You know, sometimes you have to keep a fish. You know, if it's it's in gills or bleeding, or whatever. But I figured the rainbows were following the brook trout, figuring they were going to spawn and they were going to eat the eggs, and so they were around the. So do they have a lot of brook trout, like in the mountains and stuff like that? I imagine. They stock them up it's there. Mainly, mainly rainbows. You okay. know, and we had the last time I was fishing, they we had a you know the cormorants. I don't you know you know the cormorants come out and there were flocks of them, and they were pretty much cleaning out the river. They like three of them would go into the water and swim and chase the trout, and they're you know and they'd eaten the trout. I remember we we went. We did an hour drive down through this weird place and uh, got all set, ready to fish, and a flock of 20 cormorants went over. And so you go to the river and you see the cormorant crap fits on the rock. You know, and, it, and so, in fact, the, when they have the spawn run on the river, um, there's actually pelicans fly in. I mean, yeah, we get we get the cormorants pretty bad uh, here. They they'll migrate through this area, 
And if it's if they get a lot of snow in the states of, uh, north of us, Dakota, South Dakota and Minnesota and and North Dakota, if if that if they have a lot of snow and their winter is kind of hanging on a little longer than normal, a lot of times those cormorants will stay in the Nebraska area for a longer period of time and just pa instead of just passing through like they normally do. So there's some years where we get a lot of a lot of um, they'll devastate a farm pond. If you have a farm.